I'm Julie Arliss from Academy Conferences. I'm here at the University of Aberdeen with Leon van Ommen, who's very kindly agreed to come and talk to me about different symbols that are attached to Christian identity. Not just symbols, but different practices that are attached to Christian identity. Yes. So I'm wondering if you, if, whatever you think is the most important, or where will you start wherever you'd like to, because this isn't something I know very much about. All right. A Christian symbol. Well, I, I think a Christian goes to church. Probably that's a very basic yeah. thing. Like a Muslim goes to um, the mosque. Um, a Jew goes to a synagogue. A Christian goes to a church. Uh, and in the church, all kinds of things happen, of course. Uh, so they go to church to worship their God, just like anyone in another religion would do. And they have their own uh, their own set of symbols. And signs. Yeah. So, what about? Is, would you see baptism as um, a kind of sign of Christian identity? How yes. Does, how yes, that, I do. How I would do. that work? How would that work? So, baptism is an entrance right into the Christian community. That's one right. way of looking at it. So, if you if you would approach the topic from anthropology. It would be classified as an entrance right. Okay. It's a right of passage. So you go from one state, not belonging, mm -hmm. to another state. You belong to the Christian community. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are many questions. Um, do you do that as a baby, an infant, or do you do that as an adult? And obviously, the way you do that, the, what, what you choose, expresses different views of what baptism is, what it means to be a Christian. Ah, oh, so. Could you tell me some of those differences sure. and, and what they, what different meanings are attached to those different points? Okay, so when you look at baptism, I, I think one of the, there, there are two major discussions, I would say. One is, as I just said, do you do it, do parents baptise their infants or have their infants baptised or is it an adult or Mm -hmm. a young teenager who makes the decision themselves. That's the first um, big issue in, uh, when, you, when, you, when you think about baptism. The second is, do you need to immerse the person fully oh. into the water? Okay. Or is just a couple of drips of water just enough? Okay. <laughs> right? Those are the two issues. So, going to the first issue, infant baptism versus adult baptism, or believer's baptism as it's sometimes called, um, I think theologically there are two major differences there, or emphases. It's rather emphases than, than necessarily uh, opposing views, I would say. Um, so with infant baptism, the emphasis is on God's grace. So the parents believe that the child belongs to God's people, belongs to the covenant, the relationship that God has with his people. And so they say, well, because the child belongs, the child should be baptised because that is that entrance right that I just mm -hmm. was talking about. So, obviously, the child needs to be baptised, mm -hmm. right? They, on the other hand, you have the believer's baptism or the adult baptism. And there the emphasis is on the choice that person makes mm -hmm. to belong to the Christian community. So they would say against the infant, infant baptizers, like, how does the child get to choose? Mm -hmm. um, you make a choice, a choice for the child, you shouldn't do that, the child should be free. Mm -hmm. And it's a free choice. And so baptism in that regard becomes more of a kind of a testimony. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So when you go to a church service where they baptize adults, you will very often uh, see that that is accompanied by, accompanied by testimonies oh. of those okay. people that right. have themselves baptized. So their young the emphasis is, is, is on, on the choice, on the testimony, on the believer saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, I want to follow Jesus Christ, I want to be part of that community, and therefore I get myself baptized there. And how did those differences arise? That's a good question. Um, it's actually, it's a complicated question. How did they arise? And one of the things why it is such a discussion is that the New Testament, the Bible, the Christian, um, 
where the Christians base their practices on, is not very clear about it. So if you go to the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament, as some would say, there you have the practice of circumcision. So that was the entrance rite of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Whenever a child was born at eight days, well, the boys actually, yeah. not the girls, don't ask me why. Um, the boys were circumcised at the age uh, uh, of eight days. Yeah. So Christians would say, or many would say, mm -hmm. and certainly the infant baptizers will say, mm -hmm. baptism replaced that oh, Jewish okay. rite. Okay, that makes sense. So the Christian rite became baptism. In right. It's basically the same thing, the child, child. belongs to the covenant. So yeah. instead of circumcision, we have okay. baptism. Interesting. The New Testament is very, very silent on this matter. On this matter. So we have um, examples in the New Testament of whole households that mm. get got baptized, right. of adults yeah. that get baptized. Mm. But did the households include children? Yeah. We don't know. Well, very likely, yes. But it's what we what we call in theology. It's an argument from silence. Yeah. So no one knows, really. Mm -hmm. So you need other arguments. And um, so the believers. Baptizers will say, you know, we don't have the evidence of children, so. And Jesus, when he was baptized, was an adult. Exactly. John the Baptist was, it seems, baptizing people who made volitional choices as adults. Exactly. Exactly. So the biblical and so is what they the evidence on. is the evidence is adults get baptized, mm -hmm. and infants we simply don't know. Yeah. Well, so what's about the whole doctrine of original sin? That, that one came later. Okay, um, this is Augustine. This is Augustine, definitely. Gifted yeah. us with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the notion of gift is interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, of, of, I mean, there are many, many uh, different views on that, of course. Um, but I would think, I can't say for sure, but I would think that those who do infant baptism also have a few of original sin, that original, that every person is born with original sin, um, like they're, you know, they're burdened by that and baptism actually frees them or cleanses them, whatever image you want to use, because mm -hmm. there are many images for baptism of course, um, cleanses them from the original sin. So the child needs to be baptized, otherwise it's still in sin. And therefore in history you had practice of uh, at least the Roman Catholic Church that mm -hmm. whenever a child was about, about to die they had to be baptized very quickly because otherwise, otherwise mm -hmm. you know they would go to purgatory or mm -hmm. worse because mm -hmm. they were not baptized. Right. So that's <laughs> that's that original <laughs> sin, but this is really complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but original sin and infant baptism are sort of paired usually. Often, but well, yeah. not always. Yeah, but I, yeah, that, that is right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I would hesitate to reduce the whole okay. thing about baptism to original sin. Of course, okay. Because baptism is much more. I mean, right. it's one one of the areas yeah. definitely that you that you think about. But it's it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is also that entrance into the community. Mm -hmm. It is. That, it has that notion of cleansing. It has the notion of. A promise God will be there for you. Yeah. Um, so, so baptism is more than just yeah, linking it to original okay. sin. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. And what about the drop it, the sprinkling or the dunking issue? Oh, right. <laughs> 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 dunking. <sighs> to be honest, I don't know where that practice exactly comes from, the sprinkling practice. I mean, the immersion is very clear. Yeah, John the Baptist. Exactly. Yeah. John the Baptist baptized his followers uh, by. Immersion in the River Jordan, mm -hmm. um, in uh, the apostles and disciples did the same, uh, presumably. So, where the sprinkling comes from, to be honest, I don't know. Because that's kind um, of the mainstream practice, isn't for it? For infant baptism, it is. For believers' baptism, it's usually oh, immersion. Okay. And it's okay. interesting what you see nowadays right. in, in churches that traditionally adhere to infant baptism. When there is an adult baptism, for example, a new conflict to Christianity, um, they used to do sprinkling, but more often there you see uh, that, that oh, immersion nice. is practiced there as well. I didn't know that. And I think um, many would hesitate to just immerse a, a baby, just yeah. you know, point them into the <laughs> water. And maybe, maybe that's why they do still, <laughs> still the sprinkling bit. <laughs> Ear defenders are actually going under. <laughs> Health and safety. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> might be all it is. Well, yeah. it is more than that, but mm. yeah. Um, mm. So you yeah, expect. So, so a pretty clear marker of Christian identity if someone's yes. been baptised, entry yes. into the faith. Yes. So in the world, when um, someone's been baptised and they're wandering around the streets and going to Sainsbury's, um, how would anybody know that they were baptised? I mean, there, there are no kind of public markers of identity, it seems to me. For, for a Christian, when for, for other faiths they've got a kind of dress code or there's something obvious and visible about their identity, but it doesn't, uh, unless I'm wrong, I can't, mm. I don't think there is one with a public mark of identity. No, not in, in that obvious sense, although, although one obvious uh, sign might be wearing uh, a cross, yes. for example. Yes, true. But then there are some countries who even forbid to mm. wear that publicly, um, right. which is. Well, that's not a discussion, I guess. Mm. Um, but that, that could be a marker. But then there are many who wear a big cross without necessarily yeah. attaching it's any Christian meaning to it. Joking. So, mm. so yes, you were right. There, there is less of an obvious um, religious dress code. Uh, that's right. I'm not entirely convinced that religious dress codes are the best way of showing that you're a Christian. It's interesting when you look at the Gospels um, and the stories of Jesus, he was very often criticizing that kind of symbolism that you see from the outside. And time and again, he said, well, it's, it's really about what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. It's really how you treat your neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's even how you treat your enemy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's about love. It's about justice. It's about compassion. It's about mm -hmm. mercy. It's really not about wearing a hat scarf or not. That's less relevant, yeah. right? So I'm not too concerned with that. Okay. But I would hope that a Christian walking into Sainsbury's would be very kind to tea. Whoever is here passing <laughs> would be courteous and generous and honest. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> by their fruits, yeah. they shall be known. Yeah. Not exactly. by their clothing. <laughs> exactly. There you are. There you are. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's so, that's so interesting. Leon, thank you. That was really, really interesting. Thank you very much for coming and sharing that with me. Not at all. Really good. Thank you for having me.